Okay, so we're continuing our series where we speak with various former uh, footballers. Our next guest has pretty much the fairy tale story in many ways. Two All Irelands, a decade at Manchester United, two FA Cups there, Euro 88, Italian 90, USA 94 squad as well at the age of 38. People often forget that. 71 Ireland caps. And it is fairy tale stuff. It's faintly unbelievable. For younger listeners, in 1975, as a 19-year-old, he was watching Dublin. They lost an All-Ireland final against Kerry. The following couple of months, he makes his debut for Dublin against Kerry in the league. He wins an All-Ireland that year, 1976. Wins an All-Ireland again in 1977. In the midst of it all, then the following year as he's playing for Dublin, he's at Manchester United. So it's just a little bit and nuts, frankly, and will never happen again. Frankly, how it happened in the first place, I'm not too sure. We are, of course, and could only be talking about Kevin Moore. And Kevin, great to have you with us. Thanks so much for the time. No problem, Joe. Yeah, I, I don't think I've too much more to say. I think you've summed it all up. <laughs> Back next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next guest. I know in every interview it comes up, and this fairy tale is the word, story of yours comes up. Do you ever stop and think in your quiet moments, God, it is just a bit mad did it feel mad at the time times have changed it would be a complete impossibility now but did it feel mad at the time even to you darting back from manchester to play for dublin it probably didn't it was mad but it didn't seem mad mm. if you can understand me it, it is one of those situations you just go around go you move along with whatever happenings at the time uh, you look forward to the next thing whatever that may be um, so from that point of view it's looking back on it now you, you start, you know, look, looking at it in terms of time distance and how quickly one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. That makes it absolutely mad that you, you would think this couldn't really happen, you know, but at the time you're living in it, so it doesn't seem as bad. Anytime I see you now, you seem like a very uh, well-adjusted, sensible, confident, just really well-rounded individual. Was, was, the twenty-year-old you, were you madly driven? Were you obsessive? Were you carefree? Like, were you, what was the twenty, twenty-one-year-old Kevin Moore like as you look back at him? Well, in the midst of all this, I think an awful lot depends on your family background. So, from from that point of view, I know how I was well brought up. You know, from by my parents, by my siblings, then as well. So we were really very well grounded in terms of, you know, nothing was taken for granted. You had to work hard for anything you ever got and all the rest of it. When it came to football, it's a different ball game because, you know, that's football becomes a passion. I was fortunate to be good at, at more, much more. I was much more a natural Gaelic footballer, I think, than I was a soccer player, even though my career, you know, ended up playing soccer more so. Um, I had to work a lot harder on that to develop that sort of it, that part of it. But I did have certain characteristics that at the time you take for granted that you realize no this do, this don't don't happen to everybody and i'll give you an example like to give a hundred percent in a game doesn't come easy for everybody even though you think it does and people think they might give a hundred percent but they might not be giving it you know there's always a little bit more you can get so it, it's those sort of characteristics that when you're playing a game at certain levels that you realize certain things you have and certain things you don't have mm. Were you obsessive about it off the pitch? Would you be thinking about it all the time? Would you take defeat very badly? Um, yes, I probably wouldn't take it badly. I wanted to win. I think definitely there's no doubt about that. Even, you know, if you look, talk to my friends now, now at the moment, they'd always say, oh, you you always want to win. You're always a winner, whether I play tennis, whether I play golf and all the rest. It's, yes, there probably is an element of, yeah, you, you want to play, you want to compete. So if you're going to compete, you might as well try and win. Um, so th there is that element. And I'd like to think it doesn't bother me um, if, it, if, it, uh, if it doesn't happen. But if you look at the, where, uh, the, where I played, the actual level I played at, when you're playing for Dublin, you're playing for United, and you're playing for Ireland, and you're playing for... It's all about winning. Mm. You know, it's not about you know, taking part. It's really about winning. That's what you're out there for. And you're in the same boat as all the other players you're playing with, because they're in the, you know, they're off the same mindset as well. Yes, you mentioned your upbringing there. I know you moved around Dublin a little bit, and then, and then was it around Southside you settled? Yeah, we kind of lived there, first of all in Rialto up to about 10, 11 years of age, and then I moved. We moved to Drimna, where I went to Drimna Castle. I lived next door to the school there, um, and that's where I finished 
kind of my secondary education before going on to university. So yeah, I will, we were always based up in Walkerstown then after that. One of eight, as I understand it. Correct, yeah. Your mother is the hero of this story, really, isn't she? She absolutely is, yeah. I was 13 when my father passed away suddenly, and um, it was my mother who was left to to bring us all up. And, you know, she had a family business as well, the, the shop, the coconut in Walkerstown, which um, she ran. And um, really, you know, we take so much from her. And uh, it wasn't what she said, really. She did it by example more than anything else. Everything was just led by example. You know, all she ever did was work hard for us, you know, and uh, everything she did was to make sure that we had, we had a better time as much as we could get. She, she, she delivered, you know, and she was just a Trojan worker as well. And that kind of would be something that I'd hope would have rubbed off on most of us. I'm not even remotely sure how you run a shop and feed egg kids every day. <laughs> how do you do it? I don't know how you do it. I can barely feed myself and work half the time. I don't know how she would have managed that. She would have managed it. They were different days. You know, they always say they don't make them like they used to. You know, mm. there's, a, there's an element of that, you know, in, in terms of the sacrifice that was made back then um, was just people nowadays wouldn't really comprehend it because of the fact that society has changed so much. Like she, she just wouldn't go on holidays, you know, you know a holiday wouldn't even be coming into, you know, stream to go away for a week. She'd just about have two days off if she could actually do that or want to do that. You know, if she came to visit somebody as well, they say, sit down and have a cup of tea. She says, no, I won't. I'd stand up and have it because she was rushing off again. You know what I mean? That was too comfortable, too easy, too nice, too relaxing. What am I doing that for? There's, there's work to be done. There's something else to be done, you know? And, and that's, that's, that's how she operated, really. And Kevin, where were you in the eight? What order? Where were you? Fifth, somewhere in the middle, squashed in the middle there somewhere. Okay. Yeah. There were very different times as well. Like the sudden death of a parent now, like as with any time, it's, it's a seismic awful thing kids might get counseling you know the world has changed that much in hindsight how did you cope how do you how does a 13 14 year old even begin to process that well once again it's interesting you say that if it was nowadays you might think yeah a 13 year old might get counseling might get help now that wouldn't even be thought about you you you, you just gone on with it you did it yourself there wasn't anything there that you know gave you that sort of help you know you didn't even get it I can't even say I got it from my other siblings. I can't even say I got it from my mother. It was something you just got on with yourself. You dealt with it yourself, as each and every one of my siblings did as well themselves, in whatever way that was. You mm. know, and um, you, you never thought of, uh, about it as being anything really. You know, I think society has changed so much more so now, and I think it's mainly because of social media. I'll be honest with you, that things have changed so much that I I feel sorry for young people now because. They've got to contend with so much more than I ever had to contend with when I was when I was their age because because of social media, you know. I didn't know how other people lived. I didn't know how other people dealt with something. You just got on with dealing with it yourself and getting out the other side. And it, to me, I think it possibly was a lot easier than what it is now. Would your mother have gone to Dublin Games, to Ireland Games, Manchester United Games? What was her relationship with your career? She... She was amazing from this point of view. She, she went to my the Leinster final, um, my first Leinster final in 76. She went to that game because I remember I'm on the pitch celebrating and lo and behold, who comes running towards me but my mother. She got in under the wire and came out and all the rest of it. It was the most unbelievable sight I'll ever remember. I'll always remember it. And, I'll, and I'm thinking, why, how you got in here? It was just bizarre. And I was amazed by it. But then after that, um, she would have gone on to the All Ireland finals, yes. And then when the soccer kicked in, when I went to United, I started picking up a lot of head injuries, you might have known, and yeah. got a lot of stitches and all the rest of it. And that completely put her off, you know. You know, it was a typical mother child, you know, relationship, you know what I mean? Oh, she just couldn't watch this happening as well. So after that, she never watched me play soccer, really. As soon as an Ireland game came on, as soon as I. As a United game came on or anything like that, she went for a walk and she came back two hours afterwards and the game was over. She knew the result and she knew everything was all right. Wow. So even during Italian 90, surely during Italian 90. Especially Italian 90, especially Euro 88 and all of that. There was one occasion she came over to Old Trafford 
and finally convinced her to come over and come to a game, you know. And I remember getting my um, my brother-in-law called to bring her into the game and see me in the players' lounge afterwards, but she didn't really want to do it. And sure enough, after the game, I see her in the players' lounge, and I said to her, see, I told you, no problem, you'd enjoy the game and come back. She nodded her head, yeah, sure, yeah, it was fine, yeah, grand. Only found out later on, as in later on that evening, she never came in, she sat in the car in the car park, and he came out and brought her in afterwards. Oh, God, that's gas. What was it like for the, the brothers and sisters, you having this amazing time? Was it, was it a, a, a kind of a, a point of get together for the family and a wonderful thing? Were they able to get to many of your games or were they busy off trying to make their own lives? They did. They did. They, um, I think we would all say that, it's funny, it's a good question to have asked among other players now as well, you know, as regards to their, you know, big families as well. It very much brought us all very, very close together because it, it was an interesting fact for them all to come over, whether it be to United, but much more so than even United, it was Ireland. You know what I mean? Going to the Euros, going to the, I tell you, 90, yeah, all of that much more so brought everybody together to be part of a group as well than really. You know? So it, that we were close anyway, but that even brought us so much closer you know? and, and still remains the same. Right to today as well. We're very close to the family. Just yeah, sure. I, I I can imagine just because uh, I always think of the families when I see um, players make it big because we, we we see them and they're at the forefront of it. But even something small, a goal celebration, and they'll point to someone in the crowd, or you know, all these amazing things are happening, and the families are along for the ride. And I always think it must just transform, even for I mean, as Tara is so sad, your your father wasn't there, but transforms kind of 20 years of a parent's life as well. There's no doubt about that. I think I'd love to look back and be one of them sometimes, you know what I mean, and see what it was like going to the game beforehand, you know, because I always maintain, you know, the best person to be positioned to be in is the supporter before the game. Mm. When the game starts, the best person to be is the player because he doesn't see any problems, he doesn't see any worries, he doesn't see any issues at all. Whereas when you're watching a game, you're probably, your heart's in your mouth, probably for most of it. As soon as the ball goes over the halfway line, you think the opposition's going to score or whatever. And, you know, you're on, you know, it's it, it's that sort of buzz about it that you have. But, yeah, unfortunately, I wasn't able to um, sample too much of that. At the time. It strikes me you got to see some pretty amazing people in the flesh. They, you know, there's a there's a Venn diagram here and you you know you 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 tick a few mad boxes, you know. I saw you talking to Tommaso Shea a couple of weeks back and he asked you who's better, Maradona or Ogie Moran, which was <laughs> yeah. there's not many people we can ask that question of. Yeah. And even then I was thinking Matt Busby, Kevin Heffernan, Alex Ferguson. Now draw a circle around that and talk to me. Oh yeah. Well Matt Busby was the figurehead, let's be honest about it. Um, I knew Sir Matt. Um, he had an office at Old Trafford, didn't he? Sir Matt, Sir Matt yeah. He would have, I wouldn't have obviously played. He was now before my time, but he was still very much the figurehead at, at Old Trafford. You would bump into him, you know, before, maybe after training or whatever else around the way. And he was, what I would say, the ultimate gentleman. You know what I mean? Um, in, in his way, in his manner, everything about him was just so gentlemanly like. I always maintained there was one other person I put into that category, and that was um, the chief scout was called Billy Bean, who brought me over to United. And um, him and Sir Matt to me was just cool for kind, and just that lovely, easy, gentlemanly way about them, you know, to make you feel at ease, to make you feel welcome or whatever, you know. And that's what Sir Matt was able to do. And yeah, you know, when I was over there, I was still a nobody, you know, as a young uh, Irish lad coming over. But I think he always had a more of an affinity with. You know, that Celtic condition, whether it be Scottish or Irish as well. And he knew a lot of his friends over there were Irish from um, around Manchester. So, yeah, so, so, so Matt was that. Then you've got, you know, you mentioned Sir Alex Ferguson then as well, another Scot, ironically, as well, but for different reasons. You know, I just had two years with Sir Alex, you know, and um, when you think about it, they probably weren't the best of Sir Alex's career at Old Trafford either, you know. So it was... Um, that was a, more or less a, a bit of a tough time then as well, really. But I always got on well with him. I would see him now afterwards as well. And, um, you know, the, the, no animosity between the two was even when we left. I remember having a conversation with him, you know, when he was letting me go and explaining to me why and all the reasons for it, et cetera, et cetera, you know. So 
no, we, we, we never had we never had an issue there. Mm. Of course, Kevin Heffernan. Kevin Heffernan was the first manager really as such that I had um, in, in terms of that I'd look up to, you know, and I looked up to Kevin a lot. You know, I think I learned an awful lot, not only just from Kevin, but from that whole Dublin setup because of the fact that I was just only a young kid coming in at about 19 years of age, 20. And, um, you know, there was all these more experienced players above. And you realise that when you're playing football, that you, the guys above you have all the experience. And if your most important thing is to be willing to listen and learn from all of them, and especially from somebody as well like Kevin Heffernan. Is it too glib of me to ask if the likes of uh, Heffernan and uh, Ferguson and Buzmi have, have something in common, some intangible thing? or it's kind of a leading question and you look for something and we're, we're all projecting onto these people, I'm sure, but maybe there is something about them that's there is one, there's, there's one thing about them and they're all, this to the core, winners. Winners. They just have that want and desire and drive for that winning mentality. You know what I mean? And that projects forward as well, which is what you want. Mm. You know what I mean? Very driven. Very driven in the way they go about doing it. Uh, you know what I mean? Because you, you cannot get the sort of results that they've got, you know, without being driven that way. Mm. And if they're driving it at the top, it can seep down through, which it does do to the rest of the team. Mm. What were your initial impressions of Ferguson? It's impossible to have predicted what he would achieve, clearly. No one could predict what Ferguson would do. It's too, too incredible. But he had obviously done very well at Aberdeen. Did he give the impression of confidence? Did he give the impression of, you know, the ruthless and all that kind of stuff? Did you, did you think to yourself, this guy's a serious operator, this guy's really impressive, or maybe it took you by surprise how well he did? You'd have to say uh, yes to a degree in the end. At the beginning, no. The one thing he had, which I would say to you, is he had an absolute amazing work rate, you know, in terms of the dedication and work that he put into it, even from the beginning. You know, he'd be there first thing in the morning, last thing at night. He'd be going looking at all sorts of games, all sorts of players. He'd be everywhere, working, 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 you know, for trying to better the team and get it right. But there must have been times when he thought, is this happening? Is this working? You know, and I'd have to say that at that time, you know, United were in a, you know, a little bit of a quandary with those talk about takeover and all the rest of it. And I think that possibly worked in his favour. You know what I mean? That um, he was able to stay on that bit longer than, than what he did do, on, on, uh, and that so it actually gave him the time, you know, because he was there four or five years, I think, before yeah. the league position, you know, got any better than sixth or eighth or something like that, which was, which that in its own right was surprising. Me. But once that first trophy came, which was an FA Cup one, um, that, it, it, it didn't stop after that, and then he, the momentum came, and he was able to build on it and build on it and get, make it better and better. You've talked about going over to United and being very raw. Like, I think initially, even as a fullback when you went over, and raw by comparison with 17, 18-year-olds in the youth squad alongside you, you know, and the odds in you making it were far from guaranteed. What did they see in you? I don't actually... This is like a disrespectfully phrased question, but... Oh, you know, they could have gone for any number of players for any number of reasons. You're incredibly raw. You're effectively playing a different sport. So what was it? Did you ever ask, why did you go to the trouble of developing me? Well, the, the big question really was, why did they sign me? Yes, that's what I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. why did they sign me in the first place? I'd come over. They wanted two weeks. Billy Bean said, I can have two weeks, right? And I went, um, I can't give you two weeks off work. I said, I can give you two days, right? Which is sometimes the best thing you could ever do. Yeah. Because if they had a, a week, never mind two weeks, they'd soon know, oh, forget about them, send them back. Yeah. Two days, I probably didn't do too badly in those two days. So after that, they went, I always remember it, in driving me back, Dave Sexton was the manager, driving me back to my hotel. And he said, listen, we like what we see. We'd like to offer you a two and a half year contract. Because I went over in February, 1st of February, and a two and a half year contract. And um, I went, wow, you know, I wasn't expecting this. And he said to me, why is there a problem? I said, well, do you mind if I take a while to think about it? And he said, yeah, sure. Well, what do you want? I said, give me three weeks, you know. So I asked for three weeks to think about joining Man United, which totally sounds bizarre to any young kids out there. And, but I needed every bit of that because there was a lot that I was, 
I felt I was giving up because of Dublin. Not be not so much because of my job, but because of leaving Dublin and leaving the guys there that I was, you know, so hooked up with. Um, but the reason going back to joining United, it would have come from Billy Bean, because Billy Bean sent over players to United. And when he sent over a player, because he sent them over, that was good enough for them to say, tick the box and go, yes, we take that particular player. And that came through from his time with Sir Matt Busby. And I'll tell you just a quick story, Joe, on that, because Billy Bean said it to me. When he was, get, when he was bringing over players, he didn't bring over a player for about two, two, two and a half years. And he said to Sir Matt, he said, Sir Matt, don't pay me any more money. I haven't sent a player over for about two years, two and a half years. And he turned to me and says, that's the reason why you're worth the money more than any other scout we have. Because when you send over a player, we know, oh, that's, all, that's good enough for us. And I've no doubt that continued on after Sir Matt days, that would have continued to. Tommy Kavanagh was manager after that. Wilf McGuinness was a manager after that, you know. So when you look at all the players that did go over, like Mick Martin, Jerry Daly, Paddy Roach, Ashley Grimes, loads of Irish went over it and successfully did well with Manchester United. So, you know, that was down to Billy Bean. So along came myself and then after me, bigger again really was Paul, Paul McGrath. So that worked very much in Billy's favour and in my favour, you know, with that when I went over. Billy had given it a stamp of authority, if you want to. Oh, that, 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 that makes more sense to me. But then that begs the question, I don't know, did you ever ask him, what did Billy see in you above so yeah, many hundreds that, of players? That leads, that leads on to another person, <laughs> which I'd like to mention, unfortunately, passed away. Was I played my final year when I was at, in, in, um, in UCD. I played for UCD in the final year when I was in Tour Commerce. I played for the UCD team. Yeah. And in that year, playing with them, the manager was a guy called Ronnie Nolan, right? And Ronnie Nolan, in his own right, was a great player. Nice. Right? He played with Shamrock Rovers for many, many years. And he was asked at one stage, I believe, by Billy Bean to go over to United or to go over to Florida, but he never did. So Billy and Ronnie would have been very close. Now, Ronnie Nolan would have seen me for a full year playing football, right? And I've no doubt Ronnie Nolan would have been an influence on Billy Bean to say, by the way, you know, this guy has got a lot going for him because I was finished playing with UCD. It was into the following year when I was playing with Dublin then more than anything else that I started playing with Pegasus. And while I was playing with Pegasus is when Billy Bean saw me play. But I've no doubt that Ronnie Nolan would have had an influence on him then as well because he only saw me play in a couple of games. Okay. When you went over and started trying to make your way at United, was it... Game understanding that was the hardest aspect to bridge, or was it a technical gap? I presume fitness was fine. Fitness was fine. Technical gap would have been huge. I think there was a, a lot I would have needed to know technical-wise. Um, the one good thing is that just as regards tactical-wise, you know, would have been able to pick up quickly and easy enough on that. Um, even though in those days, well, it was more straightforward than it is now. It could be a lot more tactical game now more than anything else. But um, it was just trying to adapt to the level that you were at then as well, really. You know what I mean? Um, but very much technique. That's, that I had to improve so much more with technique um, and, and learn a lot more about the game. You know, And that's what I had to pick up quickly upon. And I was fortunate that I had, as I said, a two-and-a-half-year contract. So, you know what I mean? Um, so it gave me time then as well to learn. Like, we're going to get rid of you in the middle of a two-year contract. Yeah. Yeah. I always remember in, in Niall Quinn's book, he talked about um, at Arsenal, Frank Stapleton was always the, the fellow they talked to the youth players about. And, you know, when Stapleton was your age, he could do this and this many keepy uppies and he could hit that spot on the wall 30 times in a row with left foot and right foot. And Quinn used to, you know, practice, practice, because he had to improve his technique. And we know what a brilliant kind of touch player Niall Quinn became. Did you do any of that kind of stuff to improve your technique or was it just in training that happened naturally? I, I didn't do a lot more, just in training. I, I, would, I would admit I, I did it in training um, more than anything else. I can't remember when I was coming back to play for Dublin, I used to do some solo runs on my own going up to <laughs> when nobody else was watching. So if I did any technique, I was still to remember how to play Gaelic football. <laughs> so if Matt Busby happened to be walking by and you're running the ball soloing, that would yeah, take exactly. you away. He would have wondered, what the hell is this guy doing now? And are you, are you like, you see, you take three weeks to make this mad decision. Uh, I think everybody listening 
and I even by the, the standards then, not even like the millions that you'd make now. I think I think I read in a piece you did in Sunday Independent with um, Paul Kimmage, or it was a hundred pounds at United, seventeen pounds at the accountancy firm. You know that that's the difference in salary. But even leaving money aside, I think for most people they make up their mind in five seconds. I've got to go to Manchester United. Like deep down, did you know you were always like, of course you're going to go to United because you you have to know if you're going to make it there. I, just was it that difficult? Like, were you ever close to saying to United, "No, I'm going to stay. I want to do. I want to do double." Oh, very close. I, I went from day to day. One day yes, next day no, next day yes, next day no. Um, and as I said to you before, the, the reason being, as I said to Paul Kimmich at the time, was that I'd always ask myself in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, I wonder could I have made it, because I could always come back. But if I never went, you know, you could be asking yourself. I wonder could I have ever made it? This is Manchester United. It did help that it was Manchester United as well. I, I think if it was just an, another club, you yeah. know, from the Premiership or whatever, I, I might have done it. Man United, you know, frankly, how do you say no to that? And yet you're making it a hard place to start off as well because it's going to be so much more difficult to get into that team. Um, but it was a question I had to ask. I, I have to say yes to. Uh, but at the same time, it, it was absolutely a killer for me to say goodbye to Dublin. Mm. Who was your main centre half partner at United across the eighties? When I went over there, there was two guys there that was that were ingrained in that particular position, and because they were both the, the two that played centre backs as well for Scotland, and that was Gordon McQueen and Martin Buchan. Yeah. Martin Buchan was the captain as well, and there were two great guys. There were two great guys once again that you could learn from. So when I eventually got into the team was because Gordon was injured. So I got in beside Martin. So I played beside Martin for a good while, for a while, a number of games. And then when I came out and Gordon got back in, it came back in again. Um, it, it happened the other way around. Martin got injured and then I came back in to play alongside Gordon. And I played with Gordon because Martin was just finishing up his career. So you learn from both of them. Two different, completely types of players, but great to learn from. And when Paul arrived, did he... Play midfield a good bit, or was he centre half? Yeah, no, no. Paul arrived. I think Paul arrived maybe a couple of years later. Yeah, Paul was around. Yeah, about maybe two years, three years later. And, and Paul took maybe a year before he got into the team as well. You know, he, he didn't go straight in. It took him a little while, I think, um, before that happened. And then Paul and I started playing together then as well, really. And th unfortunately, the worst part about Paul and myself was that we never put together a string of a long games together. We might have played 12, 14, or max and then one of us would get injured you know we weren't able to string like 30 40 games which you should be able to do you know i think when the likes of pallister and bruce came into the united team you know in the next stages with ferguson then as well i think that i think they missed two games together in like six seasons or something you know it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a bedrock it was a foundation yeah it's a pity because I, I i well i can safely assume playing alongside paul mcgraw was a pretty enjoyable experience it was it was it was great. We we knew each other so well, you know, and it, it is about getting on, you know, with, with, with people, you know, understanding what they do, what you expect to see them do on the pitch as well. You get to know, you know, where to cover, where not to cover. He did the same with me, you know, who'd go for the ball, who'd fall off. So, he, you know, it, it is an understanding between two players, you know, because you you two stay in the same positions, really, but up front you'd have two strikers and they'd move around. So it'd be about, you know, Passing them over and being in, in contact and in touch with them. Who were the trickiest opponents around that time during, say, mid '80s, when you're winning an FA Cup '85 territory and, and, and settled into the the role? Who were the, the big names uh, then? Lineker was around. Wasn't the, obvious, the, the obvious one, there's no doubt about it, was um, Dalglish and Rush for Liverpool. Of course, of course. Yeah. Uh, that that was some lethal combination. Um, but yet, for, from they never really scored against us, and all the time playing, they never did. You know, so. You kind of like think, well, why why do you say that? But they were the lethal com combination. No doubt about it. But for me, the guy who gave me the hardest time was Graham Sharp of Everton. Everton, yeah. You know, and and Peter Witt gave me a tough time as well. I always found from Aston Villa. Um, so it's always the ones that you found more difficult to to deal with. You know, or if somebody scored against you, you know, on one or two occasions, or whatever. You know, obviously you don't like that. But mm -hmm. It just shows you how much more tougher you found that rather than, as you say. The dog leash for your rush. Was it kind of everything you you might kind of hope it would be professional 
athlete's life. Manchester United, you know, you're young, you're man about town, you've got your teammates, you've got a few quid in your back pocket, you've got a bit of fame, whatever that's worth, I don't know. Uh, we, like, do you remember that decade there as just a, a great, exciting, fun time, or maybe it's it's not all it's cracked up to be in other ways? No, no, it was. It, it, it was an absolutely fun time. We, we had a great time, a great era as well. And once again, I go back to, you'd almost like, if you want to call it freedom, you know, you're, you'd, you were free to go out, you know what I mean? You were free to enjoy yourself. You know, you could have a beer or two beers, you know, and if somebody wanted something, it was an autograph, that was it. You know, it, nowadays it's completely different. Sure. You know, because of social media, it's, it's a video, it's a camera, it's, it's a picture, it's everything, you know, so, um, you know, I think it's much more difficult for, for players in this generation, even though they've got the luxury of what they're earning. But I've often talked to players I've played with, and even with all the money in it as well, we would all say, no, we, we, we lived in the best era, mm. you know, as regards. We were able to make a bob or two, but nothing to the extent of what it is now. But we were able to have so much more, I feel, enjoyment in it. Not to say that's not enjoyable now. It is, because the game itself is enjoyable. It's just mm. that afterwards that you can just chill and relax that little bit more if you say 1980s to manchester united fans part of the part of the shudder you know it's liverpool domination uh with the exception of the the two fa cup wins and there was that famous cup winners cup tie against barcelona like there were there were there were definitely moments but obviously liverpool were the top team and i uh, did did your team under atkinson ever properly challenge for the league and and, and if not what was there, a, was, there, was there kind of a mood of frustration at Old Trafford for a lot of your, your period? There was. And I can always remember, um, which, hap- which has happened to Liverpool now, and I know they're going to go on and win the Premiership, but it has happened for them as well. We went on, and I remember thinking, 24 years since you won the league, 25 years since. And it's almost like the team now at the moment, that you're in this team, and it, your fault is 25 years, by the way. Even though you weren't there, you've only been here for five years, or four years, or three, or six, yeah. or seven. You know, but it's made it look as if... And, there is a burden on that, you know, which I've no doubt Liverpool, you know, the fans go through. It. You know, United fans went through that as well. You know, that heavy burden, not won the league for so long, and Liverpool winning it. But going back, we did have a great chance in 85, we won the FA Cup, and we started off the following season, the 85, 86 season, and we won our first 10 games. And I remember thinking, you know, you know, the, the bookies weren't even going to take any more bets, really, you know? even though was the first 10 games were only gone. We, we drew the 11th, which is, uh, I think was a way to Luton. And then we went one maybe to the next. And we didn't lose a game, I think, till our 16th game. And then we had a few injuries. The, the, the wheels fell off a little bit. And what happened that season, Liverpool finished the season with, in their last 13 games, they had 12 wins and a draw. You know, so they finished it almost stronger, if not as we started it but you're better to finish strong than start strong so how, quickly, the how quickly did you realize jack charlton for whatever reason it was going to work this this you know have kind of been a magic was in the air with the quality of players he had with his methods love them or load them that whatever was going on the the chemistry was right this thing was going to work it's a good question that you know once again you, you you never, you wouldn't have thought you, you you feel it coming. You know what I mean? You think, oh, it's just around the corner. Or, you know what's happening. Um, what you did feel was you looked around that dressing room, you looked around that pitch, and you went, "Hey, hold on a second. This is a bloody good team." You know what yeah. I mean? You looked at the individuals. You looked at how where they played. You looked at the experience of the players as well. You know, we were all like late twenties. You know what I mean? Maybe early thirties. You know all. All of that age where you know you can rely upon these guys then as well, really, you know. Jack did get a way of playing that we always felt, yeah, we could have done, you know, we could have been allowed, if if he encouraged it, which he didn't, to look to play a bit more football, you know. But that was left up to us as well, yeah, in some ways. He, he never encouraged it, but he didn't discourage it. He did want to play it long. He did want to play it in, in, in behind as well. But he'd always say, you want to play football, play football, but don't lose the ball. I mean, so, oh, so that was the key then as well. I think everybody would remember the in, in the Euros, the game against against Russia. And yeah. We probably played some of our best football then as well, and that's because they dropped off, and we we the guys there knew what exactly what to do. We keep the ball, we pass it around, which we did do. Um, so when it was on, 
you know, it was up to us to go and play it, and we were capable of doing that. But mm-hmm. yeah, Jack did put. There's no man, no doubt about it. He's the manager. He's a guy who set, sets it up then as well, really. And we've got him to thank for an awful lot. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I, there must be still such a bond amongst that group. Like it's, there's no need to, even for an Irish radio audience now, there's no need to recap what happened. There's no need to pick out any, you know, everybody's talked about it a million times. It's embedded almost in everybody's consciousness. Can't imagine what it's like to be at the center of that and in that dressing room and looking around at, the, you know, those 15, 20 lads. Like you're a lucky git all the same, Kevin, to have. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent to be, to be involved. But I come back again, you know what I mean? I've been so, so, so fortunate, Joe, man. I look everywhere I've looked, whether it be Dublin, first of all, that yeah. group of guys were just, honestly, we're still so close now. Unbelievable. Then I move into the United dressing room. They were brilliant. Then the Irish guys, unbelievable guys, you know, still are now. You know what I mean? So everywhere you've moved along, you know, you've had this amazing group of guys that I've been associated with. And if anything, I look back on. More than anything else, it's that camaraderie I've had with those three different groups, more so than anything else, is what really makes it so, so special. In fact, obviously, the football is what you're there for, but mm-hmm. that camaraderie with, within everybody at the time was just immense. So you, you, are, you were so lucky. You're dead right. You're absolutely so lucky to be part of that. And are, are you a religious person? Do you believe in fate? Do you believe things are written in the stars? Or, or, or what's your view on, on why things happen or don't happen? No, I don't think too deeply into that um, uh, in, in, in terms of, you know, lucky socks or lucky this or lucky that or do that around the same way. I, I might do I might do something again if it worked the last time, you know, but um, I, 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 I do believe that it's going to be hard work or whatever else it's going to do it rather than uh, mystic faith, you know what I mean, or something like that from, from that point of view. Were you I still on the pitch uh, for the penalty shootout? Or did you or did you come off? Were you, were you still there? No, I was still there. Were I you played the whole game. I played the whole oh. game. Where, where were you on the list of penalty takers? I would have thought the 12th. <laughs> after Packy, <Bond. laughs> after, Yeah, even after Packy. <laughs> I, I was shattered. I always remember when, when Dave O'Leary scored that goal, everybody got up from the centre because we had to stay in the centre circle. And, and they all charged. I remember they were all over as I looked up. I was just still picking myself up from the ground. Oh, my, my legs, are, you know, they, they really were. I just felt so knackered at the time. So, yeah, I think I would have been further down that list. Even though I tell all my friends and everything, I was next. I was going to go. <laughs> was uh, going to USA 94 at, 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 am I right? at 38 years of age? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, was, right. I was 38. And I had gone there because... Well, not because obviously I was with the squad, so I was delighted to be there and be in the squad as well. But I remember thinking, I've got a chance as well, because Jack didn't know whose pairing was going to be at centre-back. He had no idea. The only one he knew was going to be there was Paul. Mm. Um, then after that, I think there was um, Phil Babb, who had just come into this team. You know what I mean? He'd only been in the squad. Three years. Yeah. If that, if that, if two weeks. It was myself, and there was... Um, uh, Hernahan as well, Alan Hernahan as well, who, who would have been more or less there. And unfortunately, I never even gave myself a chance because the first week of training over there, I pulled my hamstring. Okay. So that completely just ruled me out then as well. So I was out of the equation. Um, so yeah, it would have been interesting to see if I was fit, would I have started? I have no idea. Because um, Jack sometimes would make up his mind literally, you know, on the day he would have assessed people how they did in training and and what the makeup was. But in some ways, I think when I look back at the heat that was out there as well in USA 94, maybe it was a good thing I pulled my hamstring. Hmm. Had football changed much from 81, 82 when you start making your way, 94? Like it's, it feels like it's changed so much even this century, the last 20 years, especially now watching games back, just how technical things have become, the fitness of the players. What about, what about from 81, 82 to 94? I, I would feel from afar it didn't change as much in that period. There wouldn't have been, there would have been the changes coming in. Yeah. Right? Um, there would have been more, sometimes the pace of the game you played in 81, 82, right? It was more about um, almost fast, get it down, get it down, cross it into the box, get into the box, get back, get forward. It was all that. You give a ball away. After that, it became more possession. Mm. Right, the game was more about 
don't give the ball away. And that was coming into it very much in the likes of 92 and 93 in, in terms of, you know, keeping keep, keep control of the ball, keeping it more so, which it is now about more than anything else, right? I, I go to Old Trafford and even now, I notice that if, if a player passes a ball and it goes astray, poor fella can hear the booze from the crowd on that. Mm-hmm. He's like, well, what have you done? Give, give him the ball away. In our day, you could give a ball away for fun. That was not a problem. You could put a, a ball up there for two people to contest it and you'd have other players come around to pick up the seconds, as you'd call it. Nowadays, there is no seconds. You know what I mean? You know, it's, it's completely about keeping possession, which sometimes can be very good to watch and sometimes can be very, very boring to watch. You know? yeah. Nothing's happening. You know what I mean? On the, on the pitch. You know, like at times, I must admit, in our day, 81, 82, goalkeepers had a job to do. You know, nowadays, so often the goalkeeper is redundant for a lot of the game because he's not worked. You know, because unless they're sure they're going to score or going to do something, be, they, they don't take that chance. There's definitely a balance in there somewhere because even watching some of the older games on TV over the past couple of months, it can be a little bit frustrating to watch the extent to which the ball is given away constantly. Like, it's just, will somebody get the ball down here and, and, and pass? But equally, as you said, there are times in the last five years, ten years, where you watch a game and there's almost a deadness to it because it's so controlled and so possession-based. Correct, correct. I, th- I think it depends on the level you're looking at. I think if you're talking about, which I was referring to there, top level in terms of United, Liverpool and all the rest of it, you don't see many balls, that's Man City, you don't see many balls being given away at that level, or even among a lot of the premiership clubs. I do feel at times when you come to, say, watching Ireland say as well, you know, that it's a different game then as well, really. You know, We're, some of the players are not up to that high standard to be able to keep possession or to be able to have the confidence to be able to do it. They were getting more and more in the last game or two, I felt, right? That, you know, to encourage them to have, you know, almost like the balls or whatever. And it does take a lot, you know, to get a ball at the back and start passing it around. And you think, oh my God, what are you doing? You know, you can even feel the crowd saying, what are you doing? You know? So, It'd be great to encourage that, but you do need guys with very good technical ability and very good confidence in their own ability to be able to do that. And you need other people there helping them as well to give them options on the ball. That's so important. Yes. What's home to you now? Is it always Dublin or is there a part of you? I mean, you've been in Manchester. Are we saying most of your life now? Just yeah, I have been in Manchester most of my life. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Dublin is all, will always be home. Dublin, of course. But you know, I've got four kids, and they all live over here. They're all born over here. You know, so you know, in and around this area here, you know, it has been home. But it's lovely to think that, you know, it's a half an hour away as a flight to Dublin. Where have the other Morans spread? Obviously, you're you're now Ray Moran's brother as opposed to um, him being yours. He's, 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 he's <laughs> that's true. That, that Things that the role has been reversed. Yeah. Very true, so, Joe. So he he pops up in the sports bulletins more than you these days when someone yeah. gets injured. So he he's done fantastically well for himself. Are 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 brothers and sisters mainly at home or have they? Yes, um, they're all they're all in Dublin except for one and one brother who's in who's in London. Right. Yeah, that's it. Um, but everybody else is at home. Okay, so when you and, and do you get home much, Kevin? Um, I have until this coronavirus yeah. set in, um, but hopefully we will we'll, we'll soon be able to move that along as well. Um, yeah, I try to get home as, as often as I can for family occasions, um, for business as well, um, and that's but um, and, and for holidays as well. You know, there's always a there's always a good round of golf to be had over there. So from that point of view, my brothers are quite clean in that and. Unfortunately, we're due to go and see Hoagie and Bomber down in Kerry for our annual Brothers Away Golf Day. But that was um, scheduled for the end of April, which has to be cancelled. So that has to be rescheduled. That's a lovely thing that that relationship has endured, isn't it? And that Dublin Kerry team seemed to get on like nobody's business. It's um, it's a very GAA thing. It's it's uh, there's a touch of magic to it. The way you it, 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 it wasn't it wasn't when we it wasn't when we played against them. Did it? <laughs> yeah. It's very much developed afterwards. You know, there was no love lost on the pitch before or after. I think as well. You know, even though you'd still because they were such good guys, you'd say hello and all the rest of it, but. It's very much developed afterwards as well. I think there's been a sense of recognition from both sides, you know, about the quality of what both teams brought to the game, and especially that Kerry team at that time, to me, was the best 
football great football team ever until the present Dublin team came along. Yeah. Who did you tend to mark in those games, say 77, 78, 76? I, I marked a few. I marked a few. There was um, Mikey Shee, there was Ogie I marked, there was I think there was Paulie Lynch and another one. You know, they they they, they changed it around. If you think back, they different guys in that position centre forward. I, I stayed centre back, but they they did switch different people around. There's a brilliant start. You'll know which game if it's 76 or 77. Apologies, but um, Mullins passes the ball to you, and you decide to make a break forward. And there's a there's a one two, I think, with Bernard Brogan Senior, and you have a cracking yeah. goal. Uh, I, was was that a new ish thing? Like, you know, this brilliant, athletic, young Dublin centre back racing through the opposition half. I mean, I, there was definitely probably a point where defenders didn't go much beyond the halfway line. It's true. The the it was nothing that was planned. We, we'd never done it in training. Uh, we'd never planned anything well. It just opened up for me and I just saw the um, opportunity and kind of like went forward. That was it. Um, and I should have scored it to be perfectly honest with you. you know, it's a, yes. I look back on it and go, I don't miss that, you know. I just kept it a bit lower I was in. Um, but it, it set us up, I think, anyway, in that particular game. That was the start of the 76 on Ireland. And then I carried Claire and touched the ball. You know, even according to me, all over at the time. So, yes, and there was a few more runs in that particular game that I did do. Yeah. Um, once again, nothing planned. It just happened. I was able to do it. Yeah. You obviously had a fantastic athletic ability to do that. Yes. Yes. And, and it's the it's, it's ability to do it. It's a confidence to do it as well. Mm. You know, they do it now, the players do it, because the game has changed so much. Mm. Um, you know, to be honest with you, it's amazing the game now. The fitness levels now are, are just amazing, I think, in, in Gaelic football. You know, you see a corner back and he can be up there scoring a point or forward. You'd never have had that really in RJ. Like centre back doesn't seem that far back now. You know, when you consider when you consider how far the other guys run from the full back line to the full forward line. Yeah. Back. There was a something reminiscent when Owen Merchant did his thing in the All Ireland final uh, last yes. year. Breaking forward, it just opened up a bit for the opened two. Up for him. He just kept going, kept going, and then bang, took the shot. Were you out of games? Did you get back for the finals? I did. I did. did. Yeah, I got to them. Oh, I haven't missed any of the finals, thankfully. Yeah. Um, one last point I want to ask you about. So you, you go to Blackburn, and, and I think Kenny Dalglish says, come on, stay involved, and maybe there's a, there's a place with the reserve team coaching or some kind of coaching possibility for you. Uh, you do seem to have gone on to had an unbelievably successful, in so much as I can see, I'm not obviously... ...privy to all your affairs, but the, the, the agency business seemed to go incredibly well and was floated on the stock exchange in, in 01, I think, and there were big headlines about, you know, how, how well things had gone for you at the time, and I know you're involved with the Santry Sports Clinic. So... Uh, Business does that 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 clearly is something you're you've an acumen at and maybe gives you a bit of a buzz, a bit of a purpose. Uh, maybe talk to yeah. us about that, like I mean, because it's it's daunting at 34 to be starting over. Yeah, 38. I was always involved in business. Once again, it comes back to my mother in some ways. We had the shop business then as well. It's always been in the blood to work away in the shop there. Then you must remember, I went to UCD. I did a bachelor of commerce degree. That gave me a foothold as well, as regards, especially when we went public in 2001 with, with, with um, proactive sports management. And I was the finance director doing that. So business has always been kind of like in my blood. Even when I played football with my wife, we opened up a number of card shops. You know, and she used to run them while I did the books. And then I opened up some pizza shops, like three pizza shops that I ran then as well, while I was playing football. So right. I was always looking to see other outlets that you know would just keep me busy then as well and that I'd be active in as well really so when the opportunity came I could have gone stayed with the football as you said then I was offered a reserve team job by uh, Kenny Laglish at Blackburn Rovers but at the same time a friend of mine Paul Stratford and Jesper Olsen were looking to get together and build on something new at the time which was just perfect you know because football agencies were coming to the forefront at, you know at the beginning of 94, 92, 94 with the Premier League. Mm. So it was a good time. And, you know, it's like anything in business. It's, it's all about timing. And I've been fortunate. And in a lot of aspects, that my timing has been quite good. You know, and it, with 
that and, and, and with the support of Olivia Clinic. Right the way through. Uh, are you doing much now or have you kind of stepped back from the, the daily stresses of, of business life? Well, very much back out of it. I'm finished with the football agency altogether yeah. now at all. I'm not involved in that. Um, so I just do literally the sports surgery care. I'm on the board of that with my brother. And um, I also do some property management, which I look after. It's a bit of a portfolio that I, that I have myself, which I've built up over the years. Right, okay. So yeah, it's it's nice. It's it's easy to manage, and easy to um to control. Yes, um, so that's so. Kevin Moore, who's playing for Man United, has a few pizza shops on the side and is doing the books for his wife's <laughs> card shops. Bloody hell! <laughs> that's it. <laughs> it's a strange world. Um, listen. Oh, somebody had texted. They wanted to know. They wanted to know before I let you go. Um. Did you ever get an FA Cup medal after 85 or, or was that addressed? Or did you oh, it was, yeah. It was It was given to me. Um, it was left in the dressing room at the beginning of the following season. It was given to me. It was just handed over to me in the dressing room. That was all there. So what a ridiculous what rule that on the day you don't get it. I mean, I really. Tell you, I tell you a story about it on the day, right? On the day, Ron Atkinson pulls me at the side and he says, by the way, I've just been told you can't, take your, you can't get your medal. And he says, you go up those steps. You deserve to go up the steps anyway. You know? So I, I went up the steps. And the guys handed me out the medal. You know? And I've actually said to him, no, I can't take it. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously he just keeps and puts it down. And the friend of mine that I knew told me ages later, he's in the stadium and he's taking it all in. And um, uh, Fred Ayer is his name. He's a journalist with, um, with, with Manchester City. Right. And uh, lo and behold, he's coming down from the balconies at the top, and he wanted to go into the into the box area of the, um, where the presentation is, and just to see what the view was like from there. Lo and behold, he looks down, and there's the medal. So he he actually picks it up and brings it back in and gives it to the FA. Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> That's how much they knew about that. Much nonsense on the day. I mean, have to yeah, happen. Uh, even know you. Who who could come along? And I'd love to know who was the person who came along and made this up because it never happened before. Somebody got sent off and decided to make it up. That oh, by the way, yeah. there's been no precedent. Decided to say that he can't get his medal. Yeah. You know, when you think about it, how ridiculous was that? I know you were shocked and disgusted to be sent off in the moment. I have. I, I'm too young to remember, but I I just watched the tackle and I was like, I mean, it. it, it it looks like it, <laughs> did you do does it look worse than it felt? Because it looks like a fair old match. It looks an awful lot worse than what it was. Right, but, okay. No, I'm I'm coming I'm going across one way and he's going the other way. So he's come over my body as I sit in low. My my foot isn't high. Okay. But I must admit, after the game, you know, in the press conference afterwards, they showed it to me and I thought, oh my <laughs> I look at this in horror. I couldn't believe it. I, I honestly thought, wow, that does look bad. Yeah. But but it wasn't. It really wasn't bad at all. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I mean, you won the medal. People still talk about it as this dreadful, horrific thing, but I mean, you won the yeah. match, thank God. It's they do. Some people are afraid to even mention it to me. They think, God knows. Right. It's game of football. Well, listen, uh, thanks so much. It's been great to chat about a whole host of things. It's, 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 I mean, it is the most uh, freakish career, really, that anyone's probably ever likely to have in Irish sports. So, Kevin, thanks so much for your time. Great to see you're doing well, well over there, and um, we might check in at some stage down the line, I'm sure. But thanks so much. Okay, take care. Cheers, Joe.